Welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Gary Severance with Henry Schein, and I'll be your moderator for this evening. I am excited to welcome Dr. Carson Carpenter, a leading clinician and president of Compliance Training Partners, and Lisa Thompson, certified and registered dental assistant and manager of dental clinical services at Midmark as our speakers this evening. They will be reviewing the safety, compliance, and efficiency within your sterilization and infection control processes. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to go over some housekeeping rules. If you have a question, please type it into the box labeled have a question on your console, and we will answer them live at the end or if it's pertinent, the speakers may represent it during the program. This webinar is sponsored by Midmark, and it is eligible for CE through Compliance Training Partners. You'll get more details at the end of the program. Dr. Carpenter and Lisa, welcome and thank you for being with us tonight. I'll pass it on to you guys. First off, I'd certainly like to thank uh, both Midmark and Henry Schein for sponsoring this event. Um, and of course, tonight we're going to give you some practical applications on safety and compliance, as well as sterilization efficiency in your office. Now, first of all, let's talk about the standards. Um, first of all, CDC, as well as ANSI and AAMI, they create the standards. Uh, OSHA, the FDA, uh, as well as your local health department often enforce these standards. And of course, the standards we're talking about, we're talking about sterilization, disinfection, cleaning. Um, and as we all know, this is not a simple task. Um, it requires multiple steps. We're using technical, high-tech equipment. Uh, so to do that successfully, one thing to keep in mind is, is we need to have policies in place, written policies. We need to have policies and procedures to, to train people so that they understand how do you contain these instruments in the operatory? How do you transport them safely and in, in a compliant manner to the sterilization area? Um, and then once you get in there, how do you handle these instruments? Um, how do you prepare them for sterilization? And a big part of this is following the manufacturers, what they call IFUs, right? The instructions for use. But again, this is something that requires training. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So a quick review. Let's just review Spalding classifications. Uh, first of all, critical items. These would be things that penetrate mucous membranes or they contact bone or they touch tissues that are sterile. Now, these items need to be heat sterilized between uses if they're reusable devices, or they could be single-use sterile disposable items. That, that's another option too. And of course, examples of these would be our surgical instruments, our, our all of our hygiene instruments, um, scalpel blades. Um, so many of the things we use are considered critical items. Now, hand pieces, this is something that's really it's changed a lot over the years. I can remember uh, when no hand pieces were sterilized at all. But now, most of us are really pretty good and have been for years about sterilizing high-speed hand pieces, sterilizing low-speed components. And what I mean by that is, is straight hand pieces, uh, contra angles. All those things have been sterilized for a long time. But, but one thing that people sometimes don't realize is that we also have to sterilize low-speed motors. And, and the reason is, studies have shown that the internal surfaces um, can become contaminated through, through this Venturi effect, right? It literally can suck bacteria, virus into there, then spit it back out through a sterile um, contra angle. So, so what the CDC states is this, if a motor is connected to air or water, it needs to be sterilized, simple as that. Also, one other thing I wanna mention, your hand pieces. This means, of course, that we're probably going to have several, we're going to need several more hand pieces. We're going to need probably three low-speed motors, I would think, in each operatory to be able to constantly sterilize them between patients. So if you're buying hand pieces, remember, these are FDA, or they should be FDA-approved medical devices. A lot of the cheap online versions are not, so be careful there. Now, semi-critical items, these are things that contact mucous membranes but they don't penetrate soft tissue. Now, the CDC says high-level disinfection is acceptable 
But sterilization is recommended. It's encouraged. And as far as I'm concerned, that, that's really the standard. That's, that's really what people expect. For example, every one of our patients certainly would expect that our mouth mirror, our amalgam condenser, cheek retractors are all sterile. Non-critical items, that's a little bit easier. We're talking about things like uh, pulse oximeters, blood pressure cuffs. These typically contact only intact skin. So there you could clean and disinfect with a low uh, or an intermediate level disinfectant. Now, the next section that we're going to do, the next several slides, I like to call it preventing sterilization disasters. It compliance training partners where we, we deal with thousands of clients across the United States who call us for compliance advice. We regularly receive calls from offices that are quite panicked because they found out that by accident, they've worked on patients with non-sterile instruments. And you might say, well, how could that happen? That has to be a terrible office. I'm telling you, many times it's really a good office that just wasn't following protocols, that didn't have proper training. And we want to talk today, among other things, about how to prevent a sterilization disaster in your office. Thanks for that review, Dr. Carpenter. It is important to know what exactly goes into an autoclave. How can we keep things clean for our patients? Because obviously, we want to be safe for our patients. We want to be safe for our teammates. And a lot of times, we sometimes get into this good enough mentality. And by that, it's not that we don't want to do a good job, but we feel we may not have time or resources or equipment to do it in a way that's appropriate or we might want to look at it just a little bit differently and look at the productivity and profitability that doing things the right way brings. Um, we all have had um, all the assistants, all the hygienists out um, with us tonight. We know about that doctor's favorite instrument that maybe didn't get processed appropriately. And now we're rescheduling a patient or waiting for that to come through our asepsis uh, process. So not only is processing, you know, essential to being safe, but we also want it to be productive in our practice. So ask yourself this question. If you think about your sterilization area, what would someone from the outside think about? Would they think they were safe in your office? Would a new assistant or a new hygienist want to work in this space? Um, we all know uh, most of the states across the U.S. right now, it's very difficult uh, to hire hygiene. It's very difficult to hire assistants. We have this great resignation going on. So one might not only think about our sterile process, but also how we can use this area to keep or attract our new teammates. Because the reality is Assistants are in and out of our sterilization area 80 to 100 times a day. We live in that space, right? Um, a lot of times these spaces are not adequate um, to do a, a proper or efficient job. Um, a lot of dark corners. Uh, we have sh a lot of problems with sharp injuries, uh, people walking in and out in the wrong direction, bumping into each other in the space. And those are all things that can make a not very profitable practice if we think about it. And then the problem is we really don't think about it because we don't see the problem or we haven't had this happen yet. You're so right about that, Lisa. And that also creates such a liability for a practice, too. It really does. It really does. So we really need to dive a little bit deeper into what this space is, uh, not only just being safe for our patients and processing, but safe for our teammates as well. So there is a proper workflow. The CDC recommends this workflow, um, receiving and cleaning, having adequate space to uh, not stack trays, right? So many times I've uh, been in an office where we're behind or we need to uh, get to our next patient. And so we're stacking trays up, which is a fall hazard. Someone can get poked. So we need to think about things other than just a sterile instrument at the end, but what can happen in between? And then do we have enough space to properly clean and wash and rinse and dry, right? And we know how important that drying process is. And the sterilizers, do I need one sterilizer? Do I need two sterilizers? And it was quite interesting. There's actually math out there that will show us, you know, we've 
added X amount of patients to our day, we need more instruments or we need another sterilizer or both. And then, of course, our monitoring is part of that CDC process and our storage um, and being able to have space to store our clean instruments in a covered area. So when you go back to the office tomorrow morning if, or Monday morning, if you're lucky to have an, an easy week this week, um, some of the areas that you can really look at your space and, and see if there's anything that you can improve upon right away would be, is it designed in such a way that I can create those spaces? Can I organize in that area? Do I have that one-way workflow? I'm not stepping back into a different space or laying a clean instrument in a dirty space or vice versa. And what does my equipment look like? Do I have enough to facilitate doing that efficient job? Uh, is it newer equipment? Do I have an ultrasonic that's big enough to hold maybe the new cassettes that my hygiene wants to use? So each of these, uh, we really need to uh, take a look at the CDC steps. Think about the layout, think about a plan. Do I need to put something into place to make this a better? Think about products and materials that are used in your space. Do I have cabinetry that's designed that I can wipe it down? Um, it, it doesn't have cracks in it from, from heat in that area. Um, moisture. We work with a lot of chemicals. So this space needs to be able to withstand all that harsh environment. You're so right about that, Lisa. And, you know, that's why this is a perfect lead into what I'm going to do. I'm going to go through these different areas that the CDC says we should have. And one thing I want to mention um, that, that I don't know if we mentioned in the beginning is Lisa and I have agreed we're, we're very happy to take questions as we go. Um, obviously, if there's too many, we'll answer uh, them at the end. We'll have a Q&A period at the end. But with that in mind, I wanted to answer a question here that Terry asked, because this is really a good, great question. And, and what is said is, Washington's new infection control rule requires sterilization of low-speed handpieces effective August 31st. That's really true, Terry. And what's interesting is because our company does work all over the country, I've been telling doctors in Washington for years even though this law didn't go into effect until August 31st this year, in other words, a couple more weeks, I told them two, three, four years ago, you need to sterilize your low-speed motors now. Why? The CDC says you need to do it. And if you get into trouble with a patient, they're going to say, well, haven't you ever heard of the CDC doctor? Well, what do you mean you're not sterilizing your handpieces? Washington is part of the United States. So, so I, I agree it's it's good that the dental board is doing that, but we need to do it all along. We need to do it now. Someone else asks, how do you sterilize an electric motor? Um, I will tell you that take a look at the instructions for use. If you don't have it, simply go to the website of your handpiece manufacturer, look up the instructions for use, and they'll tell you how to properly sterilize that. Um, someone also talks about, would, you, would I address ventilation concerns, standards as it relates to employees? Um, well, you know, Ventilation is kind of a, it is an important infection control thing. One thing that I would suggest, only because we, we only have so much time tonight, take a look at our Compliance Training Partners website. There is a COVID PowerPoint on there, practicing during the COVID era, and it talks specifically about ventilation ideas, ventilation requirements. Now, receiving clean and decontamination, this is area one. This is where you put instruments into a covered container to transport them to the sterilization area. I, I like to call that a sharps caddy, and we'll show you a picture of that in a while. You want to be wearing protective equipment because don't forget these instruments are contaminated. We're talking puncture-resistant gloves, face masks, eye protection, long sleeve clothing. So the dirty instruments are basically uh, brought uh, into the sterilization area, sorted, cleaned, um, getting ready to be packaged and then sterilized. And these are a couple of my favorite devices. I like these devices that, that take our hands off of it. An instrument washer on the left, an ultrasonic cleaning device on the right. And this is the Sharps Caddy I mentioned. Something that you can put cassettes or loose instruments in, contaminated, reusable instruments. 
uh, that can be put in here. This is a sharps kit. So let's take a look at what we might see out in reality, Dr. Carson. And I agree, you know, those sharps caddies are so important because when you have a small space, like what we look at here, when someone's walking in, that's a, a poke hazard, right? That's a sharps injury hazard. So um, some of the spaces we see can be too small. Um, obviously, there's not a lot of counter space in these photos. What really uh, gets me in these photos is where's my ultrasonic going to go? And we had a, a question come up about how important it is after the ultrasonic cycle to have um, to have dry instruments be packaged. And that's incredibly important. Uh, anytime we try and put wet instruments into our pouch, um, our pouches are, are wet and we have uh, they may break through. The instrumentation may break through. And that's another sharps um, scenario that we don't want to have. So very important for instruments to be dry before they go into their pouches. And then, of course, uh, some uh, instruments uh, will rust if they're not dry and put through the autoclave. Um, but what really got me here was we have the coffee maker sitting right next to our dirty sink area, which um, I guess in the morning might be efficient, but uh, yuck. Uh, doesn't sound like a very, very good thing. The other thing that I see here is um, under the sink, we have our uh, soda stored, which um, we all know we shouldn't have any food or beverages in this area whatsoever. Um, so just a couple of things to look for when you get back uh, tomorrow into your space, things that we can immediately um, resolve. But you're right, right. And I'm glad you showed those pictures, Lisa, because not only is it just not a good thing, that's something that, trust me, in an ocean inspection, that that would be a violation. They are not very happy when they see food and drink in a laboratory area like that. Now, the second part of the sterilization area, prep and packaging, this is, of course, where we get the instruments ready to go into the autoclave. So, Again, these instruments are separated into sets or put into cassettes if you're using them, which I highly recommend. I love cassettes. Uh, hinged instruments are, are opened. Um, remember, don't use rubber bands. They don't hold up well in heat at all. Um, also, we, of course, want to rinse and, and dry uh, things before we package them. And somebody had asked that question, and Lisa was right on, in my opinion, that a wet instrument tends to get a package wet. A wet package tears, a torn package is no longer sterile. So you've got to repeat repeat the process. So also chemical indicators. Don't forget that your packaging needs to have internal and external chemical indicators. That's a requirement. And also we need to verify our sterilization each week by testing each device. Test. So what we really see out in our world, um, again, we have lack of space. But lack of workflow, and I know all of all of you assistants and hygienists out there, you're picking these apart, and that's exactly why we show these photos. We really want you to pick apart these images and find all of the things that can be improved upon. Um, one thing that I saw here, again, minus the ultrasonic in the picture, is basically I don't have any space when I take my clean instruments out to, to store them. And if I'm taking the hot trays out and putting them on top of the autoclave, how does the next person know whether or not those are processed and clean or still dirty or not? And, and I know everyone's going to say we have indicators for that, but we also all know how busy we get in this area and in our day. So um, just kind of think about designated spaces when you're working. Now, in this third area, we're actually talking about the autoclave itself, the actual sterilization process. Of course, steam is the most widely used method today. I think almost all of us use autoclaves. Very few use dry heat. Again, proper personal protective equipment and always follow the manufacturer's instructions for use for that device. Um, it's really important to arrange the items you put in there. So in other words, the, the, there are loose instruments. If they're in a cassette, which again, I prefer that they're put in in a way with racks and separators so you can get free circulation of steam. And also when it comes time to dry, that you can dry those instruments properly. Um, and always we, we want to let that full cycle go through. We don't want wet instruments because, again, 
they're no longer sterile if that package tears. And I always say uh, exactly what Lisa said a few slides ago. If you're getting wet instruments, if you're robbing, I say robbing the autoclave early before uh, the cycle's through, you probably need more instruments or another autoclave. I mean, an additional autoclave or both. So this one reminds me of somebody was about 10 minutes late into the lunch hour and was trying to be efficient and get all the instruments in. And so this is this is a no go. <laughs> this is not good because what we need is for that steam, obviously, to have area and space around the pouches so that the steam is able to uh, to do what it needs to do. The, the idea here, uh, the solution here, and I know um, one of the questions was uh, speaking to loading and sealing pouches correctly and placing uh, them in the autoclave correctly. We recommend the use of what we call pouch racks. Um, sterilize, our sterilizers do come with a pouch rack. You can also order cassette racks. And by utilizing these racks and loading your instrumentation and all your pouches on edge, this keeps them from laying flat and burning. We've all had those uh, bottom rack uh, that come out of the autoclave and they're kind of burnt on the edges. Uh, so that will alleviate that problem. And having the racks will allow you to put more pouches into your autoclave. It's more efficient. So you're not having to have this feeling of, of packing your uh, autoclave full. You're going to get much, uh, many more instruments, many more pouches in using racks. Um, also, what we see is uh, aged Sterilizers, believe it or not, sterilizers have an end use, right? They have a life date. Um, so if your autoclaves are greater than seven, eight, 10 years, uh, you really need to have uh, a tech come in and make sure that they are still working appropriately. Let's talk a little bit about the types of um, sterilized, types of autoclaves. Uh, but before I do, I just want to quickly answer one question only because a couple slides ago, I showed an ultrasonic um, cleaner. And someone asked here, how often should the ultrasonic solution be cleaned? It should be cleaned daily. I highly, highly recommend that you use an enzymatic solution and that it be closed, cleaned or changed, I should say, changed daily. Now, when it comes to autoclaves, there's really two types that you're going to see out there on the market. I call it the, the older style gravity displacement and the newer style dynamic air removal. Now, these pre-post vacuum machines, these Class B devices, in those, the autoclave chamber, the air is actually removed uh, by vacuum before and after sterilization. That's why they're faster. That's why they're more efficient. That's why you get bone dry packaging. Uh, I myself have gone to one of these um, for that very reason. I get bone dry packaging. Now, we talk here about steam uh, flush pressure pulse. Uh, here in the chamber, the residual air is removed by repeated steam flushes that there are in, in these above atmospheric pressure pulses. That's, that's how the steam is pushed out. Now, I will tell you that gravity displacement, the reason it's slower is the chamber, uh, the, the air in it is actually displaced just by the incoming steam. That's why uh, am I right, Lisa? Probably these dynamic air removal machines are probably about almost 30% faster, aren't they? They are. Now, also, let's talk a little bit about, and I see there's a couple of questions about this. Someone had even said that they see a, saw a sterile picture of a sterile bath, um, cold sterile bath. Is that even allowed? Well, let's talk a little bit about um, high-level disinfection, cold sterilization. In other words, chemical disinfection, cold sterilization. First of all, I'm not a real fan of it. I really don't recommend sterilization or high-level disinfection because the chemicals are quite hazardous, glutaraldehydes, hydrogen peroxides, parasitic acids. And the other problems are this. Inherent problems are that they're less reliable because, first of all, they're time-consuming. Typically, the instructions for use would say, 12 hours. Well, how do you know it's really been in there 12 hours? You can't spore test it. The other problem is you can't package it and use it later. You have to literally take it out, 
with sterile tongs, rinse it off with sterile water, and now use it immediately. And it's just not a practical solution in a busy dental office. Um, because remember, if you don't use that instrument right away, it's not considered sterile. Now, one thing you want to remember is you don't want to handle wet packages for, for the very reasons we both Lisa and I mentioned earlier. They tear easily. Wet packages tear. It's also so important that you verify this color indicator. It's a simple thing, but this one is colored black. You can see the circle is internal. The triangle in this picture is external. They both are black. That shows they've been exposed to heat. So important to do this. It's, it's one of the most critical steps to make sure you don't have a sterilization disaster. Always make sure, too, that for the autoclave um, that you're following uh, the manufacturer's instructions for use. I mean, we, we happen to have uh, Midmark autoclaves. We have the instructions for use printed out, and that's part of our training, how to properly clean them, how to maintain the pressure release valves. These are things that make these high-tech machines last longer. So make sure training on autoclaves is part of your protocol. Don't just turn people loose with these machines. Ah, uh, the no. age-old question, Dr. Carpenter, the age-old question. And we know we have a couple of questions about this in the, uh, the Q&A chat. So paper up or paper down? You're right. You're right. That is an age-old question, and that's a question that we still get so often. Now, again, I'm going to tell you that most experts really feel that it should be either paper side down or on edge. And when you stop and think about it, to me, that only makes sense. I mean, if you take a package and you turn it plastic side down, now you've got a swimming pool liner or a bathtub, right? Water can't get out. Even in the best autoclave, I'm sure you'd agree there's the potential for some moisture being in that package. If that paper is down or on edge, that moisture has a chance to diffuse out. So I strongly feel it should be on edge or paper side down. I agree. And this is for just efficiency. This is where those racks were able to get more pouches, more cassettes into our unit uh, anyway. So it's, it's a, it's a win-win. Now, the CDC actually says that you should use, quote, mechanical, chemical, and biological monitoring to make sure sterilization is effective. Now, when we're talking about mechanical, we're, we're talking about um, looking at, at gauges, temperature gauges, time, uh, timers, pressure indicators. Let's face it, most of us don't have a chance to sit there and watch that all the time. But what we certainly look at are these chemical indicators, in other words, the heat indicators, so that we know those instruments have been processed. And of course, the spore monitoring. And spore monitoring is so important. First of all, it's required. We'll still get questions at compliance training partners almost weekly asking if they can just do it once a month. You can't. You've got to do it once a week. We'll get questions if we're only using a machine occasionally. Do we have to test it every week? Yes, you have to. Any machine you plan to use on a patient, you need to test weekly and keep these monitoring records. If Mr. Jones says he got hepatitis in your office because you don't follow CDC guidelines, I want you to have records that you've kept for five years showing that all your instruments are sterile. In this slide, I really like this slide because this shows two things. Um, this shows on the left, these instruments look, or the package looks shiny and clean and it looks great, right? It looks just like the one on the right. That's the problem. You see the one on the left, the indicators internal and external are still red. They have not been run. The one on the right, it's been run through the autoclave. So the instruments on the left are clean. The instruments on the right are sterile. And this is part of what I call the triple check. We teach the triple check to compliance training partners. Whoever takes instruments out of the autoclave, they're trained to every package as they pull it out, look that both indicators have turned black. Now, whoever then puts them into storage, they do not put it into a drawer or a cabinet until they look and see that it's turned black. And then the third part of the triple check, whoever takes those packages out to put them on the tray for the doctor or the hygienist to use, again, checks it. 
if, if you check it three times, the odds of you ever having a sterilization disaster are very low. And it is a disaster, let me tell you, when you have to inform patients, when you have to inform your Department of Public Health. It's a financial disaster. It's a practice disaster. Don't, don't let it happen. And people ask, what type of monitoring do I like? Well, you know, I'm a real fan of mail-in monitoring. What I like about it is in a dental office, we typically are wearing so many hats, right? Our, our head assistant also is in charge of OSHA. Um, our head hygienist is running the infection control program. So I find mail-in monitoring is quick. It's easy. But I do like to have an in-office system in my office under the counter. If I get that test back that shows the autoclave failed, I know that the odds are about 70% that the test was just wrong, run improperly, the autoclave's okay. I can reach under the counter, get the in-office monitoring system, and if it's the new one from 3M, I can get the results in less than half an hour, and I can get my autoclave back online. So I like to have both. Remember, I know we might be beating a dead horse here, but it's so important. Test every machine weekly. Keep the records for five years to protect your business and protect your patients. So what do you do, though, if you do get a positive test? In other words, that spore wasn't killed. You open the mail, you realize that it failed. So don't recall items from that autoclave because that autoclave may be okay. This is where you're going to want to retest, but you would want to shut that machine down immediately until you get a retest. Don't use it or the instruments that come from it until you get that second test that shows that it's working. That's why you want to have adequate backup sterilization capacity. That's what I like about this picture. It shows two, actually, this, I think these are two M11s, Midmark M11s. It's really important to have excess capacity. So even if one of your machines down, you can continue to do business. So as you said, Dr. Carpenter, even the units that you have in the back room, and I'm hoping that this picture is one that maybe is their backup unit, because if it's not, I don't know, teams, what do you think about getting hot instruments out of this? Um, definitely a tip hazard, uh, definitely a burn hazard. We don't want to see this type of um, uh, situation right in your asepsis area. We also, again, have, looks like they, they've been uh, writing down their sterilization monitoring process, but it's not in a book. They have no way to go back um, and figure out if there is a problem here. Uh, they're kind of just laying out here at the edge. So a lot of uh, things that we can do in this space to help organize it, create a workflow, and create direction for those people that are using this type of technology. Um, I want to stop and I want to address a couple of the questions that we had. One talked about how do I dry my instruments? Um, obviously, we uh, out of the ultrasonic, um, putting them through a, a rinse cycle. Uh, if you're using one of the uh, ones that look more like a washer, a dishwasher, um, the, that will dry them for you. Otherwise, we have to put them out on toweling paper toweling or toweling of some sort and let them air dry before they are packaged. Again, we don't want wet instruments going into those pouches being sealed and then uh, possibly having that pouch rip or um, be not sterile. Even though you went through, you've now got a rip in your pouch. Um, another question addressed, how do I fold the pouch? Um, pouches are actually an, an FDA uh, cleared medical device. They do have instructions for use, and each one of them will probably tell you to um, that you have to seal right that pouch in an appropriate manner, uh, which means you have to not be folding them over so that there's a, a lip, um, and that you need to be um, sealing them so that the steam has the capability of staying inside and sterilizing the. Uh, instrumentation inside the pouch. So I hope that answered a couple of questions that we had earlier in the chat. I wanted to make sure we were clear on that. Good. Um, you know, one uh, other question I, I was just thinking, because this is 
definitely where, where you're the expert. Uh, Kathleen asked, what type of sterilizer is the Midmark 9 or 11? So we have the the newer technology in the M11 and the uh, M9 that you spoke to earlier. So uh, we can, our auto clips will work a little bit faster. And I had a question as well about that. Um, unwrapped instruments in the sterilizers and, and so on, and which was better? Was it only a time thing? Um, when you're running uh, the sterilizer on some of those unwrapped settings, remember that is for immediate use only. We're not going to be sterilizing that instrumentation and then leaving it uh, on a countertop or in a drawer, um, even on a patient tray. So that's an immediate use uh, kind of setting. So I hope that answered some questions as well. You know, and another one, at uh, least that I thought was would definitely be up up your alley. I get this question asked often, and you're you're out there. You see things in offices more than almost anybody I know. Are chemclaves still being used? I don't see many, but what do you see out there? Yeah, I mean, I've seen chemclaves still being used. Um, I see dry heat still being used. Um, yeah, as long as it's an, you know, an up-to-date piece of equipment that's been maintenance well, and you're still working your spore tests, you're still, you know, doing uh, your protocol. Um, they definitely are still in, in use out there. Yeah. You see a few of them, not many. They seem to, by and large, most people Those... have autoclaves today. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the storage area, um, Remember, you don't want to store unwrapped instruments. Again, unwrapped instruments are only sterile for a very short time. They need to be used immediately. Where wrapped instruments, these can be stored really indefinitely. I will tell you that the CDC says instruments in an intact package can be stored indefinitely. That being said, they should be dated so you can use them first in, first out. The CDC states you should do that. Use instruments first in, first out. My recommendation a date stamp, you, you can get these um, uh, date stamps that come from non-toxic uh, waterproof ink um, from, from your distributors. That way, so let's just say you have two autoclaves. Autoclave one is a black stamp. Autoclave two is a red stamp. You know which package came from which autoclave. Um, again, instruments should be stored in closed cabinets. Um, they shouldn't be stored in areas where there's contamination, for example. Um, like one of the pictures Lisa showed before. And again, store, stored basically in a cool, dry area in closed cabinetry. So what's some of the reality that we see? Um, I, I love that this team tried to be really organized with their instruments. Um, however, they punch some holes in their bags to to hang them up. Kind of defeats the purpose if we think about it. Um, so not only do we have holes in our packaging, which makes the package not sterile, uh, but we, they're not in a closed space. Um, so we're running all this other instrumentation and dirty, um, in the dirty space and they're kind of hanging right there. So we know that we can go back and, and advise this, uh, team to maybe do some things a little bit different. The other thing I see that most of you probably uh, picked out in this area is the trays that are open, the trays that are open over the autoclave, right? So um, if we were running an ultrasonic, right, we would have some some dirty uh, aerosols in the in air. Those instruments would no longer be sterile that were on those trays. Um, one of the things that I, I see that happens, and, and I've actually done it myself, is stored a box of pouches over the autoclave, right? It's quick, it's easy. Maybe uh, like this office, they don't have a lot of counter space. So you stored the autoclave bags over the autoclave and your little indicators all turned brown, even though they hadn't been processed. So had to throw that box away and, and get a fresh box. And so think about that as, you, as your workflow and you're assessing when you get back to the office. So what's a good space look like? So in a, in a perfect world, uh, or if we're designing a new build or we want to increase the efficiency in our area, in, a, in the sterilization area, we need about two feet for each of the five steps or pretty much approximately 10 feet, 10 to 12 feet of countertop at a minimum. Now, this is showing kind of an L shape. 
You could have a U shape. You could have more of a galley shape to your situation, and that's fine. But at least two feet for each step. And then maybe you have a multi-doctor office or you have a lot of hygienists. We, uh, we need a, a few more extra feet for everyone that's coming and going in that space. Um, so at least two more feet of countertop for each additional two to three clinicians. And the idea is to create that unique space for every step of the CDC workflow. And, and you know, that's that's one of the really good things about those pre-made sterilization centers is they're designed the right way. Because, you know, I, I, re I remember, Lisa, I, my first job out of dental school many years ago, I was in an office where they'd had a a carpenter built the sterilization center. Yes, you know, yes. those dimensions you're talking about, I, I don't think they were aware of. Um, I also remember all the shelves in them sagging, like in U shape, because they just didn't hold up to all the moisture and chemistry that's in there. And dentistry um, creates was, some interesting chemicals. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. No, they, they, um, they don't hold up well, just regular wood or particle board. Now, for environmental surface infection control, really for any type of infection control, you really need to have written policies. If you don't have written policies, um, everybody's doing it differently. And that is where these sterilization disasters happen, is when there aren't written policies and 90% and of the people are doing it right, but one person makes a mistake and that becomes very costly. So some simple things, of course, in the policies are just the fact that cleaning should always precede disinfection on environmental surfaces. And that cleaning and decontamination or cleaning and disinfection should be really focused on surfaces that are most likely to become contaminated. So what we want to do also is take time when you go back tomorrow or Monday, look at the instructions for the disinfectant you're using. Read that label. I mean, are you using it the proper way? Is it approved as a cleaner disinfectant or just a disinfectant? What's the time of contact? Now, they categorize environmental surfaces as either clinical contact surfaces or housekeeping surfaces. The difference is the clinical contact surfaces, these have a real high potential for contamination. These are things that we touch or things that spray and splatter get on or instruments are set on. Um, these are the clinical contact surfaces. That's where we're going to really focus. Now, housekeeping surfaces, these are floors and walls, and unused counters, dental chairs, a more limited risk of disease transmission. Now, the CDC further states that you have the option of using surface barriers. In fact, they ask that we use surface barriers on areas that are really hard to disinfect. Now, a, a, let's take a typical surface barrier that probably most of us use or have used, a light handle cover. You have the choice of either covering it with a barrier and changing it between patients, or you could disinfect it between patients with an EPA-registered intermediate-level disinfectant. That would be your choice. You could do one or the other. Now, when it comes to X-ray sensors, that's a little different. Uh, I think we all know that these are very expensive devices. Probably probably an average amount uh, for an X-ray sensor is probably about $5,000. So, super expensive. And for that reason, because they're electronic high-tech devices, they don't do real well in an autoclave. The CDC says we can disinfect them, again, with an intermediate level disinfectant, but we also have to barrier cover them. So for x-ray sensors, I just want to emphasize we don't have a choice. It needs to be both. We disinfect and cover them with the barrier cover. Now, you know, I just want to do also answer a couple questions along the way here, too, that are kind of a, are appropriate for what we're talking about here. As, uh, Cynthia asked, are there specific requirements for ventilation of an enclosed instrument processing area? You know, I will tell you that I, I don't know of specific requirements, but every sterilization area, instrument processing area, should, is, is equipped with a ventilation fan. You'll, you'll notice that areas like that always have a vent fan. If they don't, they should have one. The key thing I see is people don't turn it on. So turn on the vent fan. And, and you should be fine. Uh, uh, Sarah asked, uh, she uses a hydrum washer disinfector. Most of the time says the cassettes come out and they're wet. Um, are we supposed to wait for them to dry before bagging? One of the things, we also have a hydrum. I would have 
the tech take a look at that? Because one of the things I love about it is the fact that those packages are really dry. Maybe there's a problem with the drying cycle. That's, that's what I'm thinking of. Now, for housekeeping surfaces, um, we need to routinely clean these with soap and water. We could use an EPA-registered detergent disinfectant. That's, that's often categorized as a, a low-level disinfectant. And the reason we're doing this is we don't want to destroy these surfaces. There's no need to put more harsh intermediate level disinfectant on them. The only time I would do that is if you have a housekeeping surface, like say your cabinet door uh, gets a blood splash on it. Well, then you would want to use an EPA registered intermediate level disinfectant. Other than that, you would want to just use that low level disinfectant cleaner. It's much easier on the cabinetry. You're not exposed to as much chemistry. It's good for everybody. Remember too, the carpeted flooring, fabric upholstering, these things should not be in your treatment rooms. They shouldn't be in your laboratories. They shouldn't be in your instrument processing areas. Now, this slide is put in because people ask us a lot of questions about COVID, about SARS-CoV-2. Does it affect how we handle environmental surfaces? Well, what the CDC says is continue to follow the same guidelines we always have for cleaning, disinfecting environmental surfaces. The only caveat, make sure that the disinfectant you're using is on the EPA's list of those that kill SARS-CoV-2. You'll find that on our website. Um, probably your disinfectant is on there. Most of the big ones are on there. And this is a good time, too, to follow the instructions. Again, I mentioned it before, and Lisa and I were talking about it before the webinar, and she brought up a great point. With the shortage because of COVID of many different disinfectants, you might suddenly find yourself using two or three disinfectants in order to get enough to do the job in your office. You can't get as many of one particular brand. Each one may have different instructions for use, so be sure to read them. So we had a couple of questions that kind of talked about workflow that I wanted to just call out. And one of the questions was, can I open the instruments and, and preset my trays for the day? Remember, anytime we break the seal on that pouch, those instruments are no longer sterile. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about how patient perception um, is, is huge, especially in our days of COVID, right? Patients are very aware. And so I would recommend that pouches uh, do not get opened until the patient is in the room and you are ready for treatment. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about um, how you can actually market that and use uh, situations of sterilization and your protocols to your advantage um, especially during this COVID time. So we want you to follow those CDC guidelines, of course. Um, we want you to be uh, ensuring that you have that one way of flow, that your space allows for that, that it's kind of designed that way, that you're documenting your processes. If anything goes wrong, um, authorities are going to ask for that documentation. And of course, they're going to ask for the training of your employees or your teammates. So um, just to reiterate, make sure that you're really um, hitting on those four points when you uh, go back to the office. So let's talk about safety and, and uh, marketing as a recruiting tool. And I think this is so important, Lisa. Uh, I know my staff always love this. They, 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 they felt that good infection control made it safer for them and for the patients. It definitely Absolutely. got us staff members that we wouldn't have had otherwise. Sterilization is a big part of our workflow, making sure that we have the instruments that we need when we need them. Um, it's good to know that the equipment works for us, not us for the equipment. Safety is huge for us for multiple reasons. We worked in a setting where there were blind corners going into the sterilizing area. And it's dangerous. People don't think about it, but you have no idea how many times you're going to turn into a corridor and here comes someone with dirty instruments. We worked in a practice one that we had a corner call. We called it the corner of death. I wanted a sterilizing room that was quite big where everything flows in one direction. 
from dirty to clean and with two exits so the person coming out with clean instruments it's not going against someone that is carrying dirty instruments we have an m11 and an m9 the sterilizing room definitely keeps us going everything moves quickly everything gets sterilized quickly everything's done properly i don't have to re-sterilize items because i'm not sure if they were cleaned properly or not um it, it allows me to move faster see more patients do more of the dentistry that we like to do here sometimes each provider has two patients at a time plus what's in hygiene i've had three patients at a time and my wife had three patients at a time we have the space to do it but we have the equipment to back me up to actually achieve something like that. Our sterilizing area, I wanted big windows in there. Why? Because you can see what's happening behind the wall. Because you already know, okay, so just such as in there working, I know what to do. The flow of everything is, is, is a lot faster. That's why I wanted the window in our sterilizing room. I wanted patients to see and know exactly what we're doing. Safety is one of the things that, that we take very seriously. It does all the, the marketing for you. Patients come in, they feel safe, they feel good, they leave with a big smile on their face. That was a really good video, Lisa, and I found that. Yeah, I think everyone can like agree this. we'd all like to work work in that yeah. space. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I will tell you that, that, of course, like anything, we've got to keep current. Uh, when it comes to outdated equipment, remember, sterilizers uh, do, do have a life expectancy, and that typically is that 7 to 10-year range or 10,000 cycles. Uh, so keep in mind that, that this is an important piece of equipment. You, you may be in need of a new one. You may want to have what you have evaluated. Ultrasonic cleaners. Remember that they definitely lose efficiency over time. And you probably are familiar with the foil test, the aluminum foil test, to test their efficiency. If you're not, simply Google it up, aluminum foil test of ultrasonic cleaners. You want to make sure that your ultrasonic cleaner is working properly. And one thing I will also say is that I know there's some questions we won't get to tonight. And if we don't, uh, please feel free to visit our website. And we do have a uh, technical support area there. We've got OSHA approved trainers who can answer your questions either from a phone call, from an email, or from a chat. So um, there are ways to get your questions answered. Now, with that, Lisa, um, would you say we should uh, answer a couple more questions here? Yeah, we have about five minutes, Dr. Carpenter. Perfect. So let's take a couple more. Uh, let's no. see here. Uh, one of the questions was, how can you tell how many cycles have been run throughout uh, with a sterilizer? Uh, simple math, you know, how long have you had it? You're using it X times a day, dependent on your patient load. So you can kind of get an approximate how long. Also, there's a serial number. Um, if you don't know when the sterilizer was bought, uh, you can actually reach out to your distributors uh, via the serial number and figure out when that product was purchased. That might help you as well. Sure, you're right. You could you could extrapolate, right, to get a rough idea of how many cycles you have on that machine. Exactly. Now, I'll tell you, if, if you'd like this next question, I'd be glad to answer. It's definitely in the area of OSHA, which is really my expertise. And what is said is, if you rinse instruments in the sink, does the staff routinely, should the staff routinely clean the sink? Does the staff, should the staff use the sink to wash their hands, make coffee, et cetera? Um, I will tell you that the sink and the sterilization lab should simply be for processing instruments. Um, I, I would not want to see you making coffee, making tea, uh, washing hands to go see patients. It really should be. Use dedicated to the sterilization area. Um, I'll also mention we are going to, in just a minute, we'll put up the uh, CE code. Someone had asked about that, but fear not, we will have the CE code for you in a minute. I'll put that up now. I know we're getting close to uh, time. So, Dr. Carpenter, I'll let you explain how they get their CE. I'll be glad to do that. And the CE is provided through Compliance Training Partners. We're AGD and ADA approved provider. I want to thank, before I go through this, I, I want to thank 
Henry Schein for sponsoring this and Midmark for sponsoring this um, because this type of training is needed. This is a big problem area. I mean, I, I love practical webinars like this. I really do. Also, not to um, uh, play down the fact that this is good for one live CE. Live CEs are hard to come by these days. So make sure that you, first of all, you could take a, a cell phone picture if you want of this access code. Um, I believe it will also be sent to you. But take a picture of it. What you're going to do is go to the Compliance Training Partners website, and you'll do the pull-down redeem access code. You'll enter this code. At that point, you'll simply create an account, and then you'll take a quiz, start quiz. I think there's about six questions, um, which, of course, is a requirement for live CE. At that point, you'll receive a certificate. Now, I also want to mention to the people on this call who don't need CE, say if you're an assistant who doesn't need it, or you've already got all the CE you need, I would go through and do this anyway, because now you have a certificate of infection control training. Many states are having requirements to show that there is a certain amount of infection control training. This can help go towards that. So everybody should print out that certificate and keep it. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Carpenter. And thank you to Compliance Training Partners for providing our CE for tonight. I know I need it, so I'm going to go ahead and log in and, and get one of those for myself. As long as, long as you pass that test. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> well, good night to everyone, and, and thanks for spending this, this time with us tonight. Thank you very much. Yeah, I want to thank you. This is Gary again. I want to thank you very much for such an enlightening program. Uh, I don't think we've ever had as many questions, and I know you'll introduce that probably in your future training, some of those relative questions as well, or we'll try to get the answers out to individuals. So I want to thank you both for your time and expertise this evening, and thank you, Midmark in general, for sponsoring the webinar. We have recorded tonight's webinar, so that's a great opportunity as well. And we'll email a recording out sometime next week. We appreciate your feedback on a survey that will be popping up to make sure our future webinars meet your criteria and needs as well. Thank you all for joining us and hope you have a wonderful evening. And thank you again uh, for providing a very informative webinar. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you.